In the rest of this chapter, we're going to look at visual displays, so graphs, charts, things like that, ways to visually display your information, either to get a point across or to make it easier to look at the patterns and trends. So frequency distributions help you organize your data, but graphs and charts really help you see what's going on. Um, we talked about at the beginning of this chapter that we really like to look at center variation distribution and outliers. And these things are a lot easier to see if you're dealing with a graph or a chart as opposed to just a table of information. For qualitative data, we really have two main choices, bar graphs and pie charts. So we'll take a look at both of those. You've probably seen bar graphs before in the newspaper or wherever. Um, they're pretty straightforward. You have a bar for each category. You label them across the bottom. And then the heights tell you the frequency or how many fall into each group. A Pareto chart is a special kind of bar graph, specifically when you put the tallest bar first and then work your way down from there in decreasing order. Pie charts should be familiar as well. You draw a circle, you have a slice of the pie for each category. The size represents the percentage of the total amount. Um, bar graphs are easier to compare heights with so that you can compare which group is the biggest and they're right alongside each other. Whereas a pie chart is a little bit easier to visually represent the and compare the different percentages. With quantitative data, since we're dealing with numbers, the options are a little different. There's still a bar graph option, which is called a histogram. And, uh, but because we've got numerical values, we also have a couple of other options that we'll talk about. So with quantitative data, a bar graph is called a histogram. And they're similar, but a little bit different. Um, so one difference is, as you can see here, the bars usually touch with the histogram. With the qualitative example, I had the bars with some space in between, but these touch. Um, the heights still represent the frequencies, but if you look across the bottom at the labels, the bars are labeled a little bit differently. Instead of labeling each bar with the class, um, I've got the edges of the bars labeled with the boundaries, which are the numbers in between the classes. Another option that some people use is they label the midpoints. So you could put a little tick mark in the middle of each bar and label it with the midpoint. Either way, this is like an x-axis across the bottom where the numbers go from smallest to largest. So you could not put these bars in order from highest to lowest like you can with qualitative data because you have to go in increasing value across the bottom with the ages or whatever your classes stand for. Um, so this example is looking back at that church group example from earlier in the chapter and um, using those. So when you're looking at the distribution of your histogram, there are some different things that you might see. One possibility is it could be symmetrical. It may not be perfectly symmetrical, but you can still call it symmetrical if it's approximately the center is the highest point and, and things go down on each side from there. Uh, uniform is the same height all the way across, which you don't see very often. And looking at the skewed left and skewed right, be careful with these. Um, on skewed left, what that means is that there are more bars to the left of the high point than there are to the right. Um, it does not mean that the highest bar is on the left. So skewed left and skewed right may feel backwards to you, so be very careful with those. And then there's also the bimodal possibility. Um, it's, there's not really a visible trend. There are two groups in different places that are the highest points, and so it's hard to say that there's just one group that's the most. Harder to find kind of a central tendency on that. Another option is the frequency polygon. These are similar to histograms, except instead of drawing a bar, we just put a dot at the height and then connect all the dots. With these, we do use the midpoints, not the class boundaries. So we always use the midpoints on these. Um, and then you can see on the left, it, it, comes, it starts down at zero. And then at the right, it comes back down to zero before it ends. Another way we can display quantitative data is with something called a stem and leaf plot. And these are a little bit different because you've actually got numbers listed. Um, so if you look, you've got two columns. One's called the stem and one's called the leaf. And the stem is the first digit usually. It depends on how many digits are in your data. But here, let's say we have two-digit two digit data. 
Um, so the stem would be the first digit of the number, and then the leaves would be all of the second digits for those numbers. So let me explain what I mean by that. So look at the row where the stem is 1, so the second row there. So the stem is 1, and let's say these are ages. So the stem is 1, and then there are two leaves, a 2 and a 4. That means there's a person who is 12, and there's also a person who's 14. And then if you went down to the 2 row, uh, it looks like there's a person who's 22, another person who looks like there's two people who are 24, and then there's also a person who's 25. And so you go down like that. And the leaves are always in increasing order, if you see how I've got those listed. The top row with a stem of zero means that those didn't have a first digit. So those are one digit ages. So two people who are one, a two, a six, and a seven. Um, do notice that there's a blank row down at eight. If there's no one in their 80s, you still put the eight and then you leave it blank on the leaf side. Uh, you don't want to put a zero there because then that would look like there was somebody who was 80. So if there's no one in a group, then you leave it completely blank. You can organize these a little bit differently depending on what the data looks like. So if you had decimals, you could have like a 1.2 and a 1.4 instead of 12 and 14. So you'll see that sometimes. It just depends on what the data looks like. And there's usually a key at the top. I didn't put one here, but there's usually a key at the top that mentions what how it's organized. Um, the advantages of these are if you turn your head sideways and to the right and look at this, the heights kind of look like a histogram. So you've got that visual display of um, which group is the tallest. Um, but you still have all the actual numerical values if you want them. So you kind of get the best of both worlds there. Uh, sometimes you will see people split rows in half if there's a lot in some of the groups. They may split a row in half and have two rows with a stem of four, for example. So you may see that. You won't have to worry about that too much for me, though. Now that we've talked about the different ways to display your data, we need to talk about how to analyze those displays to get information about center variation, distribution, and outliers. So looking at this histogram, which is the church group data again, um, we can use this to sort of estimate the center variation, distribution, and outliers. We won't be able to calculate them exactly, and actually in chapter three, we're going to come back and do this much more exactly with some actual calculations. But for now, we're just trying to sort of look at this and eyeball or estimate what these values might be to get a sense for how these trends work. So um, if you're looking at center, you're trying to figure out approximately what the average would be, in this case the average age. And given this histogram, I estimated it at about 40. Uh, the high point would be where I would start. The high point's right in the middle. And then I would look and try to decide, would the average be a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left of the high point? Well, in this case, it's actually a fairly symmetrical histogram. So I would probably leave that center right in the middle. So center is kind of an average. I don't think that I need to adjust it left or right in this case. So it's about 40. Um, for variation, you're looking across the bottom. I want to know what's the lowest age and the highest age. And I can tell that by the labels across the bottom. It looks like it starts at negative 0.5, which means the lowest was actually 0. And then it looks like it goes up to 99.5, which means the highest was actually 99. So the variation is to actually say that it goes from 0 to 99, or you could say that there is a range of 99 different ages. We'll, we'll talk more about that in Chapter 3. Um, distribution would be, thinking back to those shapes that we talked about earlier, this one's roughly symmetrical. It's not perfect uh, because of that bar on the left that's a little higher than it should be, but it's close enough. So we'll go ahead and say that this is approximately symmetrical. And then for outliers, be careful with outliers. We're not looking for a bar that is unusually tall or unusually short. What we're looking for is from left to right, is there a group that's kind of far away from all the others? Is there somebody who's older than all the rest? And so looking at the far right, there's a gap before the last bar. And that makes me think that that bar to the far right could be outliers. We'll talk in Chapter 3 about how to calculate 
for sure whether those are actually considered statistical outliers or not. But for now, they do look like potential outliers. Um, so those are the kinds of things when we're talking about analyzing these graphs. That's kind of how we look at these things. And then just one last thing that I want to talk about. Um, when Back in Chapter 1 when we talked about studies that are misleading, one of the things that you also have to look at are the visual displays that have been created by other people and whether they've done them in a way that clearly depict the information or not. Um, one example of a way that things can be misleading is here. So we've got two graphs that actually have the same information. Um, so looking at the one on the left, this is median weekly income for uh, men and women ages 16 to 24. And so in the left picture, the men, you can kind of see it looks like they make about maybe 380, 390, something just under 400. And the women are maybe just under 350, so 330, 340. And then on the right, the numbers are the same. If you look, the men are almost at 380 and the women are at about 330. But the differences look much more extreme in the right graph. And so the question is why? Well, if you look at the one on the left, it starts at zero at the bottom. But the one on the right starts at 300. So even though the numbers are the same, the one on the right makes the difference look much more extreme. And those are the kinds of things that you have to look for. That means the one on the right is actually a bit misleading. So you need to be sure and always look at the actual values to make sure that you are seeing clearly what's going on here. Um, because sometimes they'll manipulate the numbers that they start at to make differences look more or less drastic depending on what their agenda is. So just look very, very carefully at visual displays and make sure that you understand what the actual information is.